Hey everybody, my name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas, and you're watching the Revelation Bible Study. That's right, we're doing the entire book of Revelation. We just figured, you know, uh, in this crazy year, uh, when people are asking, hey, do you think we're living in the end times? I thought, you know what, let's look at that. Let's look at the end times. Let's examine it and just see. And, and uh, last time we were together, we looked at Revelation 6. We're still in Revelation 6. And we're talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? The, the pale rider, the, the rider on the black horse, the rider on the red horse, the rider on the white horse, and what each one of those things symbolized. And it's pretty obvious that uh, there's more coming, right? There's, there's definitely more coming down the road. I, we're, not, we're not quite in the end times yet. But I wanted to go to a different part of the Bible and look at Matthew chapter 24 really quick. And if you haven't watched uh, yesterday's uh, video where we started Matthew uh, Revelation 6, I think you should go back there and watch that because these two things, they line up. You know, we talked about the four horsemen, their different colors, what they represented. And I, I want to show you that Jesus actually uh, mentions those writers as well uh, when he's talking to his disciples and they, they line up perfectly. In Matthew 24, uh, it says Jesus left the temple and he was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. And, and he said, do you see all these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? So they're saying, okay, what are the signs? What are the signs of the second coming? What are the signs of the end of the world, of Revelation? Verse 4, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. That sounds like the white horse, right? The Antichrist, the, the, the rulers and the people will come in Christ's name. He says in verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed, for such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is the second horse, right? The, the red horse. This is the wars that follow. And it says there will be famines, and earthquakes in various places, all of these are the beginning of birth pains. So that's the third horse. The third horse was famine, right? Verse 10 says, At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Then, he says, you will be handed over to persecution and put to death, and you'll be hated by all the nations because of me. And that would be final horse, the black horse of death. So you see, Jesus predicts all these things. He says all of these things will come. He, he repeats uh, the, these messengers, these horses. And he, he goes through the first seal, the second seal, the third seal, the fourth seal, all the horses. And he ends with Christians being martyred for their faith. You know, Christians being persecuted, Christians dying for their faith. And, and we're going to see these same sequences again in Revelation 6. So we just read about all the horsemen. We left off at verse 9. Um, John is still having this vision. And it says, when he opened the fifth seal, so this is the fifth seal now on the scroll that Jesus holds, I saw under the altar the souls of all those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. So these are, these are the martyrs. These are people who have died for the cause, people who have died for their faith, okay, through all time. Verse 10, they called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So these martyrs, they cry out, they say, how long do we all have to wait? You know, we all died for the faith. We stood by you and we, you know, we, we were we, st we stood up for, for the, the kingdom and, and we, were, we were persecuted, we died, and, and people are still dying. When, when are you coming back? Right? The, the martyrs cry out, when will Jesus return? When will he put an end to all of this? When will their blood be avenged? And, and watch, watch the answer that's given in verse 11. Then each of them, the, the martyrs, were given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer 
until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So what does that mean? Well, it means there's more martyrdom to come, right? More people are going to die. More people will die for the faith than have already passed. When the martyrs cry out, when will Jesus return? Jesus says, not all the martyrs have died yet. And that's probably not the answer we want to hear. It doesn't sound like a good answer. It doesn't sound like a good world. It doesn't sound like a good plan. Wait for more martyrs to die? Why do more martyrs have to die? That's a really good question. And you know when I find reading the Bible, um, I don't know that the Bible answers my questions. I don't know that that's the purpose of the Bible, to answer my questions. Um, I might have questions that the Bible doesn't answer. And if I ask a question and the Bible does answer, I might not like the answer. It's true. But the issue for me isn't, well, then I need to go find a church or a, or a preacher that preaches the answer I want to hear. No. The, the solution for us is to accept the answer. That may not be the answer we want to hear. We may not understand that answer, but it doesn't mean we turn away from it. God's word is truth. And what we have to remember is it's not our world. This, all of this, this is not our plan. When we say things aren't going according to plan, well, guess what? It's not our plan. This is all God's plan. This is God's world. We are his creation. You know, uh, and Colossians says, all things were created by God and for God, right? This is all for him. So it might not be the answer we want to hear. It might not be the future we want to see. It may be scary. It may be frightening. But this is the future that God has planned. Fortunately, we serve an all-powerful God. And when God is asked what his name is, he says, my name is I am. I am because I exist. And when he says he exists, he exists outside of time. God exists eternally in the past. God exists eternally in the present and eternally in the future. He dwells everywhere. He already knows. He already sees. And guess what? He's already saved. He's already conquered. We don't need to be afraid of the future if it's not the future we want to see. It doesn't matter if that future is five minutes in the future or 50 years in the future. It doesn't matter. We don't need to be afraid. Any, any fear that comes our way is, is from darkness. It's from the evil one. God doesn't use fear as a tactic. God doesn't use fear as a weapon. God, does a, God doesn't use fear as a solution. Fear is not from God. 2 Timothy says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Any human ruler that uses fear as a tactic is not from God. Any news source that uses fear to keep you in your house or to make you lock your door or to make you afraid to go outside is not from God. We do not serve or worship or love a God of fear. So, yes, the future doesn't sound great, doesn't sound like the world we want or the, the plan we would pick, but you know what? It's not our plan, but we don't have to be afraid because he holds the world in his hand. God holds the world in his hand, just like Christ now holds the deed of the earth. He holds the seals in his hand. He holds the scroll in his hands as if to say this is his. He controls all of it. Jesus cracks the seals when he is ready in his time and he will redeem in his time. He will restore. He will rule. We don't have to be afraid. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.